to record. Okay, so I hope you can see my screen in presentation mode. All good. Well, thanks uh, for the invitation and for having me today. It's my first time uh, in the meeting, but I'm planning to join also for the others. It sounds really interesting. So I'll be introducing to you briefly uh, the Urgepi project uh, in DRC that I'm mainly working on. And it's an emergency um, project where we are uh, responding to measles epidemics, uh, but also we have uh, preventive activities and uh, some operational research. Um, so the project started already a couple of years ago in uh, 2018, but we have since been like testing different strategies and restructuring. Um, uh, but the project is located uh, in four provinces of the DRC that you can see here, the Tanganyika, Utlomami, Lualaba and Utkatanga. And in these four provinces, we carry out different type of activities. So we have uh, prevented prevention vaccination campaigns. Uh, we have set up uh, surveillance uh, in these four provinces where we are working closely with the Ministry of Health. So we are basically using their surveillance system, um, but we are following the situation. We are supporting also biological confirmation really for the det early detection of outbreaks. Uh, then, of course, we are having, uh, as I said before, measles intervention. So in that case, it's both um, vaccination and uh, case management interventions and uh, operational research. Uh, maybe uh, for those, I guess, every, most of you know APSANT, but just maybe also to highlight, uh, we're <laughs> working with Médecins Sans Frontières. When I'm talking about intervention, it's, of course, not APSANT. Uh, it's uh, MSF uh, who is leading on that and who was also leading uh, on this project. So APSANT is giving the epidemiological uh, technical uh, expertise to the project. So uh, starting uh, with the component uh, that is more applied in terms of prevention, surveillance and interventions to give you an overview of how we set up um, the system. And we try to be a bit innovative uh, instead of just um, uh, considering all four provinces as equal, uh, we were trying to really identify uh, kind of areas in these four provinces that are at higher risk uh, for measles epidemics than others. Uh, and this is done in collaboration with Penn State University, uh, Matt, Matt Ferrari, who was um, already in, involved in that project uh, from the beginning. Um, and so based on uh, some modeling exercise, uh, he allowed us to uh, rank uh, all health zones in the area according to risk of measles epidemics and then focus on those uh, that are at higher risk. So we take into account vaccination coverage, uh, a model that allows us to estimate the number of uh, non-vaccinated kids, the number of susceptible kids that are remaining, and then combine this, these different indicators to get that final ranking. So in 2021, uh, we had 21 priority health zones. So basically choosing uh, the top ranking ones, but then also taking some like logistical components into account. And then in 2022, uh, we updated these uh, and um, currently we are having 20 priority house zones, so five in each of the provinces um, for this more or less political reasons. So in these priority house zones, we were carrying out uh, prevention vaccination campaigns already in 2021. Uh, 2022, uh, with the number of outbreaks that are currently ongoing, we are still trying to do prevention activities. In the moment, we are more uh, in the response, but we're trying to pick up again uh, in the spirit, like instead of running behind epidemics uh, to be ahead in time and to vaccinate uh, before the epidemic start. And as I mentioned, so these vaccination campaigns are really targeted to the areas that are at high risk of epidemics because there are a lot of num a lot of children that are susceptible, but also we are trying to take into account like to do prevention activities in areas where we can, we may have difficulties responding because they are far away from where the base is. There are issues with access. Uh, there may be issues uh, during the rainy season. So we are really trying to take this into account. <clears throat> For the surveillance strategy, we also integrated that concept of uh, priority or high risk health zones. Uh, so we are working with the Ministry of Health uh, monitoring the tendencies in all 68 health zones in these four provinces. Um, we are having alert system in place. We, uh, depending on our capacity, select alerts in priority or non-priority health zones for investigations. 
and we are supporting the laboratory in Lubumbashi. So MSF was involved in the buildup of the laboratory uh, for all of these uh, health zones. And that was really to reduce delays in laboratory confirmation of epidemics, because otherwise all samples had to be sent to Kinshasa, which is really far. So this covers the entire area. Now where it's a bit different for priority health zones. Um, so we are in regular contact with these 20 health zones. We already, uh, on a regular basis, collect data by Air de Santé, which is the smaller admin level. We collect line list data, we give a bit more support for biological confirmation and for investigations, and also uh, looking at the uh, alert threshold. So we are using a more sensitive and less specific uh, alert threshold in these uh, priority health zones to allow us to detect uh, outbreaks earlier, because we already know if transmission starts, there's a risk of a large epidemic. Um, currently, we are dealing uh, with a large number of simultaneous alerts. So in this um, context, we are obliged to prioritize alerts for interventions already for investigations, but also for interventions. So we use a set of uh, epidemiological indicators uh, on epi epidemiological tendencies, such as the number of cases, the tendency, biological confirmation, but also the delay since the epidemic started, so whether we are already too late for uh, intervening in time, but also we take, of course, the context into account. And so it's an algorithm that comes up with a score combining these different indicators and we rank them. And then we have a discussion, of course, uh, taking into account other criteria that can't just be included in the algorithm. And then based on that list, we make a decision where to next investigate and where uh, then to intervene, where we think uh, we have the most uh, impact at the current moment. So the, that list is updated on a weekly basis and discussions are made. Uh, every other week. Um, moving on uh, to operational research. Um, so a lot of what we've done in the last two years is uh, uh, vaccination coverage and zero prevalence surveys. There are plans also to integrate other uh, research components, but until now we haven't really been able um, to do that. So for vac vaccination coverage surveys, is really a, a way to evaluate our vaccination campaigns, uh, but also to better understand uh, what, what's happening in terms of uh, routine vaccination um, and uh, why, why people decide not to get vaccinated. So for example, uh, last year in July, um, there was a responsive uh, vaccination campaign uh, after an outbreak in Kongolo in Tanganyika. So a vaccination campaign uh, was ongoing and already during the campaign there were like reports of refusals uh, so after that we decided to do a vaccination coverage in the area which showed a, a coverage of the campaign of about 68 percent so much lower than our targets and you can see here a map uh, that shows the um, vaccination coverage uh, smoothened across uh, the entire health zone so you can see that there were pockets with very low coverage uh, routine vaccination coverage um, was about 63%, so also quite low. And then among the reasons uh, for non-vaccination, we found uh, a lot of it was due to absence or unavailability of the caregiver to bring their children um, to uh, the vaccination point. There were also quite a lot of refusals uh, due to religious beliefs, but also at that point linked to rumors about uh, COVID vaccination. Um, a large number was also due to just difficulties in accessing uh, the va vaccination points and a uh, lack of information that a vaccination campaign uh, was ongoing. So this is just one example. We try to do uh, these kind of evaluations more routinely to evaluate our activities, but also to really identify how we can improve um, our campaigns in areas that are difficult. Um, for the zero prevalence surveys, um, we've been carrying out uh, two of them. And so the main purpose is to quantify the number of immunized or non-immunized children. And so the benefit of doing zero prevalence surveys over these vaccination coverage surveys, where we just ask children whether they had been vaccinated, is that sometimes uh, uh, caregivers, they can't really remember if they received actually a vaccination or the specific measles vaccination in that case. Uh, they may also um, feel obliged to answer one way or another. So to actually take a blood sample and measure immunity is a more reliable indicator in that sense. Uh, also, of course, children can be immunized uh, through natural infection. So in that case, 
Um, we can also ask about uh, whether a child had had an infection, but sometimes the answer is not very reliable. So it's really, if you want to know the, the risk in a population for ongoing measles transmission, uh, knowing the proportion of children that are immunized uh, gives us a better indicator. So uh, with the zero prevalence surveys, we are trying to answer like three uh, main questions in the moment. Um, so where in general, if we go to a health zone, can we find non-immunized children, uh, both like for ta more targeted uh, interventions, but also where could we just strengthen uh, routine uh, vaccination activities? So this is done through community surveys. We can do similar to the vaccination coverage survey, a very detailed category for planning of um, activities. So a second type of survey um, we would ask, so this, like the first type, we did a survey in one of the house zone uh, like two years ago. The second type of survey we haven't yet done, but we're considering is really kind of an evaluation again of a vaccination campaign where we ask the question, did we succeed in vaccinating all uh, targeted children? So again, we go to the community, very similar to the vaccination coverage survey, but instead of just asking questions, we are also taking a, a blood sample and we can also compare uh, the the, we can look at differences between reported vaccination zero positivity. And so, for example, if we find pockets where children reported uh, vaccination, but like many of them uh, did not end up zero positive, we can ask us maybe that's due to problems with cold chains. We can uh, um, start looking more in details into the quality of uh, vaccination. And then the third question, so this is a survey we've done uh, in the end of last year during a, a prevention activity, um, is whether we are just revaccinating the same children. So this survey is not done in the community, it's really done at the moment of a vaccination campaign. And so the question is among the children that show up, uh, how many of them are already immunized? So basically giving them another vaccination shot is not going to improve uh, immunity in the community. Um, and uh, so we can also use that to compare different strategies. So if you want to implement a new vaccination strategy, we could see whether one is more efficient than the other than to really find the um, non-immunized children in a community. So the last point is more like a, a brainstorming because it's true so far, we haven't been integrating a lot of qualitative research. We've been considering, we've been discussing, but then it really didn't happen. Um, and it would actually be a very valuable component to the project because often we're a bit blocked. Like we say, we measure our um, performance during vaccination campaigns, but then we're a bit like, without ideas, how, how we can improve it, how we can uh, make it better. So um, uh, looking at, for example, the reasons for refusal, so we can, uh, for refusal or for non-vaccination. So how can we improve communication to reduce refusals, these false beliefs about the vaccination? Uh, looking at all the people that say they were absent or they were not available, like how can we, like what would be the optimal timing for intervention? So is there like a timing of, the week or the, the months or during the year, if we do preventative, preventive prevention activities that would be better suited than others. Um, what would be alternative communication channels to distribute the information to those people who said they, they, they were not aware that a vaccination campaign is ongoing. Um, and then also really looking at options for different alternative new vaccination strategies. So what would be alternative vaccination opportunities opportunities. So instead of doing like sort of max, mass vaccination, trying to vaccinate all the children, maybe we could find some opportunities like points where children show up regularly and use these as, as uh, regular um, catch up uh, points. Um, and of course, how we can improve a routine vaccination. It's not always just about <laughs> campaigns and uh, adding uh, more layers. So how can we really go to the, uh, the root of the problem? So Maybe part of that, uh, you'll have some thoughts and uh, suggestions, and I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Birgit. That was fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm going to open the floor for questions. Um, and while everyone is having a think about it, um, I don't see any hands up yet. Um, I'm going to uh, ask the first couple of questions, if that's OK. I am. I'm really encouraged to see that you are seeing something similar to what we're seeing in DRC in that um, um, 
it's not all down to anti-vaxxers, which seems to be um, the assumption um, that it's all down to vaccine hesitancy. And actually, there are other issues that play, like, like access, like availability, like um, transport and, and other things. So it's, it's encouraging to see that also playing out there. And, I, and also, when I was with MSF, we were doing um, some work that did show that we were likely vaccinating the, the same children every time there was a, an outbreak and every time there was a campaign. And the pockets of non-vaccinated children remained in those hard to reach locations. So I think it's really encouraging to see that you're trying to access those children for, for vaccination campaigns. Um, uh, Johnny, is that a hand up or is that my, that might be, no, sorry, that was my cursor, sorry. Um, I do remember Episanch uh, doing some research a while back, um, suggesting that actually the health teams were not um, as not optimizing um, opportunities for vaccination at, at EPI level, so at the health center level. So um, that every time a child came to the the clinic, um, they were often not being invited to vaccinate. And there were a range of reasons for that, including um, um, concerns about the ethics of um, vaccinating a child if the primary caregiver was not accompanying them. Um, has there been any further work on that or is that something that you're also seeing in your setting? Um, so to be honest, because in our set setting, we don't have like, um, how you say, a, a clinic, um, the, like clinical activities that are ongoing. So it's really in terms of, okay, if there's an alert or emergency, we go there, we set up our tr uh, treatment centers, we give support, but there is not like a, a, because I know some other projects, they have like ongoing clinical activities where maybe it would be an opportunity. So in our case, that's not really happening. So I, I'm not, I can't speak to the other sections in DRC how they are handling the situations, but uh, for us, it's, it's, yeah, not as part of the MSF activities. Okay. Um, we have a question by Jenny Lam from the London School who isn't able to ask the question directly because she's in a noisy train station. Um, in terms of the children coming for repeat vaccinations, i.e. the same one, what is the scale of this issue and root causes for this? What beliefs and norms do they have? Mm -hmm. So there is, so we started, we just got in the, the data from the at vaccination point survey and we have a different one in a different region to compare with. Uh, for the moment, we're a bit, uh, I can't really give the number in the moment, we are struggling a bit with the threshold uh, for zero positivity. So this is also something that has been coming up in other zero prevalence studies. Um, so depending on where we, like if we use uh, the recommended scale um, threshold, uh, we had like 30% of kids uh, that are zero positive. So that wouldn't be so much, but this compares in the moment to about 87% that actually report that they have been vaccinated. So looking in, we are currently looking in more detail. Uh, so it could be as much as 70% um, if we move the threshold. So, I mean, I know it's a large scale between 30 and 70, but it also just shows that like in terms of the serological methods, uh, there are unfortunately some open questions that, that need to be dealt with to get more clarity. <laughs> Um, great. Uh, we have three hands up and I'm going to close the questions after that just because we have so many presentations. But Jenny, would you like to go first? Yeah, I was just interested because the figures you had for the reason why people aren't getting vaccinated are very similar to research we've been doing in Uganda um, in terms of the percentages. But I was interested in your, your figure on the refusals um, and whether, <clears throat> sorry, are you finding that people are refusing all vaccines or was that specific to COVID? And are you Deep delving down kind of in specifically what their reasons for refusal are. Yeah, so, so there were pockets with which is really a, a religious uh, group. So they are um, refusing all um, vaccinations, but it's a bit specific to the setting of Congolo. Like I'm currently looking at the, it's, it's just in the um, stage of completion. 
uh, in a different health zone. So there, the the real refusals, the complete refusal, seems to be a bit bit lower. Like and not because of religious re reasons. So I, I think it really varies between um, the settings. And also, uh, we see in the recent survey there are no more people that indicate uh, fear of that it's actually the COVID vaccine. But while Congolo was just happening, I think not too long time ago, after there were all these discussions about AstraZeneca and all this, so as it was a lot in the media, and it was just also when DRC at one point started and then stopped again the vaccination campaign. So I think that really influenced people while now COVID doesn't come up as such a big issue anymore. Yeah, and one of the reasons I'm asking is because when we're finding, a lot of the people we're finding in Uganda who are refusing, are refusing for reasons that are quite easily explained if you have the opportunity to talk to them. So for instance, when you said the religion most, or there's quite often the religious objections are around whether or not the vaccine is stabilized with pork gelatin, which COVID-19 isn't. And actually that's, so refusing for religious reasons for a reason that isn't relevant to this vaccine that is easily explained by the local imam is different mm. to refusing for religious reasons because God decides who lives and dies and vaccine shouldn't be allowed. Mm. Um, and what we're finding, we, we have a, a similar figure, so it's about 21, 22% in the work we've done in Uganda. When we dig down into that, we're finding that actually only about one or 2% overall so kind of you know one in 20 of that 20 percent are for those kind of god decides who lives and dies reasons okay. so the refusal itself is quite a complex spectrum and mm. i think that helps with looking you know we're almost getting to the point where if you look at that kind of last last pocket of resistance um it's almost so small that it's it's actually irrelevant to herd immunity mm. um, and so that's kind of to quite... um stop the discussion there yeah. um, <laughs> Hilary, but Julia. thanks so much Jennifer yeah that's very really um, interesting <laughs> Hilary Julia and Christine if you could save your questions till the end or put them in the chat um and hopefully Bergy can um address them in the chat um I just want to get on to Adam now so that we don't run out of time thanks Adam are you ready to present we have Adam Eskdale from Royal Holloway University um, presenting on climate stress and its relation to livestock health and disease in India. Check. Uh, we can't see your screen just yet, but. Uh, no, it's not coming up. Do you want to give it another go? There we go, great. Thank you for the invitation. Adam, we're having trouble hearing you. Um. Adam, would you like to call back in again? And in the meantime, uh, can we switch to Justin until we get the technical gremlins sorted out? Would that be all right, Justin? Yeah, sure. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, let me share so, my screen. Great. So we have Justin Ginetti from IFRC presenting on the Go platform for situation and analysis and predicting potential risks and hazards. Please right. go ahead. Thanks so much for the intro um, and for the invitation to, to be here. It's quite an ambitious title. I'm not sure I'm up, but um, my apologies if I don't. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, the IFRC's uh, Go platform and a new risk watch module that we've just um, launched on it. Um, and then a little bit of, you know, show you what it looks like, um, as well as explaining why it exists, and then talk maybe a little bit at the end about, um, you know, next steps and what our plans are. And that's really where, where you guys come in. Um, so just firstly, a quick sort of schematic diagram explaining how this fits together and what's the purpose of it. Um, so the, the idea here was to, visualize uh, information about future risks in order to prioritize attention and uh, resources within the network. 
Um, we wanted to model the estimated uh, impact. We wanted to leverage as much observational data as possible um, about past events in order to uh, you know, make, make available uh, evidence about spatial temporal trends as well as about our own responses and interventions um, to see uh, you know, how effective they were. Um, so on the right hand side, uh, you see a schematic diagram of um, the risk module uh, and that red dinner, and then a lot of things that are being pulled into it from our partners, um, and then some of the outputs, um, you know, both within our own environment uh, and outside. Um, but we wanted to, we're not, the main point we're trying to convey here is that we're not uh, doing our own uh, modeling in house, but the role that we're playing is more of a, that of a curator. And I'll explain a bit more on that in just a second. Um, here's just a glimpse that some of the main partners with whom we've been working on this um, over the past uh, several uh, months, um, usual suspects, as you could probably guess. Um, and then behind it, one of the, sort of the bottom of the screen or on the right, you see there's this thing called the crisis data bank. Um, and that's where we wanted to have this repository of observational data. That's kind of really the engine behind this. And, and just a couple of words about that. So at the moment, we've envisaged three kinds of information. Um, one is information about hazard events. So the type, location, date, intensity. Um, the idea here is to pull this information from authoritative sources as much as possible. Second kind of information is uh, either uh, recorded recorded data or you know modeled estimated impacts um, of those hazardous events. Um, so you can see there are examples of, of the you know of the metrics and of the indicators. Um, these can certainly extend to you know potentially or be adapted to include um, public health uh, type indicators, whether it's um, number of cases, hospitalizations, fatalities due to um, infectious diseases. Um, and then the third kind of information, as I said, is about um, what actions were taken, where, when, by whom, and to what effect. Um, and you can see some of the uh, applications there on the right. Um, and, and the main point to, to convey here is that if you have all of, all of this information together and it's well mapped and it's, it's fairly transparent um, in terms of um, you know, how, how up to date and how valid and reliable it is, um, you can then use it to support uh, those use cases you see on, on the right hand side of your screen. Um, the idea for this is not a new one. Um, it builds upon a lot of uh, past work, primarily from the DRR sector. You see a bunch of stuff from the European Commission there. Um, there's the disaster loss recording from uh, the UN, uh, UNDRR. There's the MDAT, which I'm sure you all know from CRED, uh, similar database from the US. Um, and then if you go further back in time, uh, this was originally proposed back in the autumn of 1922. Um, it was written up in 1923 in the, the review of the, of the Red Cross. Um, and then on the right, there was an article that was published in 1930, looking back um, at what had been accomplished uh, in the previous 10 years. I was basically complaining that there hadn't been enough progress made. So I would shudder to think what Raul Montandon would say about us now, 100 years later, we still haven't, haven't, haven't done it yet. Um, and one thing to maybe just uh, pause on for a moment here is that within the scope of this is information about um, public health crises and, and epidemics and pandemics. Um, so that's definitely what comes to um, Another kind of main uh, intended application, especially how we relate this to um, our partners, in particular here, UN and, and OJA, for example, is to say if we have an understanding of the, the risk um, and the, kind of the, the spectrum of risk within any given country. Here, you just happen to see um, a loss exceedance curve for, for economic loss uh, for one country, but you can imagine the same kind of uh, curve for a uh, number of people displaced, for fatalities, for you know, other kinds of impacts, for primarily natural hazards. Um, what you can do is a priori um, you know, plan on how you're going to manage that risk. So how much of it would be essentially owned by uh, our national societies and local communities and national governments, et cetera, and that's what you see on the left. And that's mostly associated with the um, high frequency, low intensity, low impact events. Then you see the middle tranche there, which is uh, the part that IFRC would take some responsibility for or large responsibility for to our, our own fund. And then for those rare but very high impact events, um, those would you know, be beyond the scope of our own fund. And that's where you see interventions from like the CERF, et cetera. 
Um, and the idea is that we wouldn't be sort of manacled or, or handcuffed by these, but we can be more excellently planned um, with transparency. So I'm going to segue from in a second just from these screenshots to the actual, uh, you know, the live demo for better or worse. Um, but this is to give you a, a sense of it. And the point I wanted to make here is, is that the idea for what we're doing uh, actually originally came from articles I was reading about FluSight several years ago. And that's the, also how our role is, is kind of like what the CDC was doing um, back when they launched FluSight, which is to say they, they, were, they indicated what metrics they wanted to have predicted. Um, and then they said, okay, so, you know, they basically said, Here the, here's the, the, the playing field, here are the rules of the road. And they, they established that, and then they basically, you know, gave the space to the different modeling teams to produce those agreed upon um, you know, metrics. Um, and then the idea simply being, in every case, you compare the predictions to the observations, um, and then feed that information back to the modeling teams to validate, calibrate the models. Um, and uh, importantly, to um, begin establishing both a baseline and then a track record of hopefully uh, continuous improvement in the accuracy and skill of the models. And the idea for that is to really build confidence in the use of these models um, for decision making. Because at the moment, in, in, the, in the domain of hazard impact forecast modeling, we're in the, the relative infancy of that, and it's kind of the wild west in the sense that um, there are a bunch of different models out there, um, but it's very difficult to ascertain you know, how good any of them are or what their biases are. So the idea is simply to get started by, by, by putting together a very transparent uh, you know, you know, um, you know, uh, track record of, of each model so we can, we can you know, you know, weigh them uh, against one another and yet again to see how they're improving over time. Um, Another similar uh, undertaking that's kind of analogous is the role of like the, the 538 election forecasting models. You know, 538 doesn't have its own model um, so much as they pull in the other models and they, they evaluate the other models. Um, but, you know, and you could, if you could, if you wanted to build, you know, an ensemble of ensembles or weighted ensemble, et cetera. Um, so th this is showing, just sorry, if I can explain what you're looking at. This is just one example of um, a cyclone track. You can see the historical track kind of moving from south to north, and then uh, the cone of uncertainty around its um, forecast. Um, and you can see you know, where it's likely to go and the estimated number of people who would be exposed, uh, number of households, then vulnerable groups, and then some um, facilities that may be in the path of that, that, that storm. Um, so that's sort of an event kind of unit of measurement kind of analysis. And then we also look at things in terms of country months. So here you see, this is for floods, uh, working in Asia Pacific, um, and this is a um, number of people at risk of being displaced per country per month. Um, and we have that dynamically um, for, you know, for every country, um, for a number of different hazards and a couple of different impacts. Um, so before I jump into the quick demo, um, which will be a little repetitive and I apologize, um, just to, to, to close on the PowerPoint, um, what's next um, is the following. So we're going to be incorporating um, impact forecasts from more for more hazards um, and for more partners. So um, from the Netherlands Red Cross of Site 10, um, the Italian Red Cross Centina Foundation, um, as well as the Italian Red Cross and their partners um, in the Pandem 2 project. Um, per, per, perhaps um, WFP, Oxford, uh, GDAX, Matthias Swiss, and others. And we really are interested in, in incorporating more epidemiological risks uh, on this platform um, coming from the, from the epi models. Um, and then we wanted to, to improve the user experience, add additional features and functionality, and make it work in additional languages, and have this information available at small and more granular units of measurement, um, and make better use of the historical data. So I'm just going to take two seconds uh, to go into the next screen to show you how it kind of looks in real life. So here, um, this is. By the way, I should have mentioned this, this go.ifrc.org, which is the, the where, you, where you can get all of this. It's open source, open access, including all of the code. Um, and then if you click on you know, one of the events, here you see um, you know, dynamically what the estimate is. In this case, it's coming from the Pacific Disaster Center. Um, but as, as I mentioned, we're in the process of adding additional impact forecasts from, from the public partners. So this is for that particular storm. 
um, here you see for uh, sort of media, um, the flooding in Australia, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can go look at you know, any other regions. Maybe just one other thing to show you, it's just a kind of a country analysis so just a contest with our developers. Um, so we're gonna show you something, a couple of bugs in it actually. Um, so for Somalia, on kind of a country month unit of analysis, we can see um, some of these different impacts um, in terms of, um, so for the hazard hazard here and then the impacts here, but then also if you try to look at it all in one in one go, you can see um, population exposure to um, food insecurity as well as to floods as well as storms, etc. And then in the case of say food insecurity, what we want to really do is make visible the historical information. And this is the reason why I'm showing you this is because if we have sort of the epi curves for say you know, influenza or other diseases that have some seasonality to it, we can really put you know um, you know current estimates into you know context vis-a-vis uh, -vis past seasons or past events uh, or outbreaks, um, so that our, our colleagues can um, you know can take action based on that. And then finally, as I was saying, we want to make sure we have. We visualize, we visualize um, you know, impacts um, in return in, in the context of uh, events of given return periods. So here you see, you know, what is a one in twenty, one in fifty, one in hundred year floods look like? Same again with storm surges or or cyclones, etc. And then make as much information about past events um, possible. This is just coming at the moment from our own database. But as I was mentioning earlier, we want to, you know, leverage all of the data that we can from, you know, MDAT plus the distant Antarctic databases plus the new, the new one that we're building with our partners. Um, so that's kind of a whistle stop tour really rapidly of this. Um, so not a hell of a lot to show you about public health risks for, um, you know, outbreaks at the moment, but we really are interested in, in including this, particularly if it would be useful to you guys because the idea is not just to support uh, IFRC and the national societies, but to also, if possible, build something that's useful for other partners as well. And the person with whom we'd be doing that um, within IFRC, um, I'm, I'm lucky to have on the call um, as one of our stars, Rachel Bittermoto. I'm sure most of you, not all of you, already know. So that's it for me. Thanks for your time and attention. Great, thank you, Justin. Um, we were having a little bit of trouble with your sound, but I think we managed to grasp most of that. It's a really interesting presentation. Um, while everyone's deciding on their questions, I'll I'll jump in again first, if that's okay. I am. Um, it's a really cool platform, and um, it's uh, it's quite a simple idea. Yet. Um, really no, nobody's done it yet so it's quite nice to see all of this information in one place i'm going to ask you the same question that i asked luke when he presented a couple of days ago at the ultra information management working group um and whether you're incorporating risk mapping because um the, a lot of the forecasting work is based and um, a lot of forecasting modeling um only gives you a couple of weeks maximum um, month or two of um, of uh, data beforehand, so that that still isn't a lot of time to mobilize and respond. Um, whereas risk mapping is really trying to predict what's going to happen um, in the future. And I was wondering if you're going to incorporate risk mapping into into this platform. Thanks. Yeah, that's the idea behind having the information at the kind of country month unit of measurement and making it dynamic so you can look ahead any number of months. Um, I, I forgot to show that dynamically, but you can move, you know, that slider across the timeline from, you know, April to May to June to July all the way to, to the end of the year to see what's likely to occur over the, over the coming months vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the impacts that we're interested in or the specific risks. Um, and that builds upon um, basically probabilistic risk models, which are, you know, G basically a GIS and they convolute hazard exposure vulnerability. Um, and um, the ones that we've incorporated or ingested, the outputs of, of which already are the one from UNDRR, um, from the global, uh, the global risk model that, that's behind the global assessment report. Um, and it's slightly outdated, um, but, but um, that's, the, that's the most recent iteration of it that they have, so that's the one that we're using there. And then for you know, displacement risk, we're um, 
we were we ingested the outputs of IDMC, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center's uh, hazard-specific disaster displacement risk model, which is also based on you know risk mapping uh, as well um, of you know exposed populations um, and then their vulnerability to hazards of, of given intensities. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just checking for other hands. Um, if not, then I'm going to dive in with another question. Um, so uh, I see that you, you're you hoping to um, provide advice on the reliability of the different uh, models or forecasts that uh, are in your platform, but that's quite, that's actually quite a challenging thing to do, especially if um, a piece of work is controversial, creating some debate. So how, how are you planning to, to guide people well it's it's sort of those are the rules of the road with for being part of our platform basically it's we really really are emphasizing the, the transparency dimension so of course you know one can develop a model one can use all of the validation data that we'll try to compile from for one's own purposes but to have the you know the results of of a of a of a institution's um risk model or impact forecast model visualized we we need to have you know um we need to have both their willingness to to make their predictions visible, of course, but then um, also the information on you know the historical performance um, and, if, and and also sorry beyond and then beyond that the you know the documentation we want everyone to be able to click through um, to the, uh, you know a, a description of the parameterization of each model the sources of input data etc cetera, etc cetera, so that people can understand it which becomes especially important when you have you know multiple modeling teams making the same predictions because then you might want to you might have confidence in one set of inputs versus another set of inputs and you, or at least would want to take them you don't, you don't want to know what they are so you can weigh um you know weigh, weigh how much you how much confidence you put in the output okay brilliant thank you so much justin um so i'm just checking to see if we have adam online and yeah i'm back <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll try and give it another go. I'm sorry about that. I didn't know what happened with my Zoom messing around. Well, we can hear you clearly now, so that's great. Okay, I'll try and share my screen again. And then if it doesn't work, maybe you can present the slides and I'll talk over them Absolutely. if that's what's causing it. Yeah. But, uh, we'll good. have a go. Okay. Yeah, we can see them. You can see me. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, it's all working perfectly. Go ahead. Okay, cool. Well, again, thank you very much for the invitation to present at this session. Uh, I'll be talking about climate stress and its relation to livestock health and disease in India. This is primarily working in a project with me and Jenny uh, over at Royal Holloway, University of London. So the structure of this presentation will sort of go through the overall project, uh, introducing it, talking about what our aims and objectives were and sort of what sort of data sets that we've been using. Then I'll go on to talk about the results of what we found, what this is, what we think this might mean. And then lastly, I'll end on what we're thinking next, how the IOA could help and what future projects might look like involving this sort of data. So first of all, our study is focused on the Indian state of Karnataka, which is in southwestern India. Uh, essentially, this project is looking to integrate climate data with epidemiological data, as well as farmer experience and geospatial data to try and understand the relationships between climate and disease, and if specific climate variables are having a direct impact in relation to disease outbreak specifically diseases, uh, bacterial diseases and bacterial diseases in livestock. Uh, and this is all sort of part of the, um, it's called the DARPI project, which is chicken or egg drivers for antimicrobial resistance in poultry in India. And that's been running for the past three or four years. The specific aims and objectives of this project are essentially, as I was saying, to define clear relationships or any relationships between climate variables and bacterial disease uh, that may relate to livestock. So what we want to do from this is identify these relationships and construct hazard assessment maps that can provide spatial context to the relationships. So identifying areas where there's higher risk and lower risk based specifically on these climate variables. 
Then we want to project these findings and these relationships onto future climate predictive data, which could then essentially provide longer term future uh, warning system for higher and lower risk zones for bacterial disease outbreaks. Throughout this project, we've developed a workflow uh, that can be used to collect, define and uh, establish these relationships as long as you have the climate data and the disease data. And I'll go through that in my next slides. So all the data that we sort of used, it was a mixture of climate data. Mostly we used the crude time series uh, global gridded data, which is quite high resolution and a long term span. Um, it's also very easily accessible, which is why we chose it for this project. The disease epidemiological data that we've chosen to use for this project is sourced from the NADRES uh, GIS platform, which is a epidemiological interface run by Nivedi over in India. Uh, and they provide outbreak disease data online since about 1987. Therefore, the time frame that we used for this research was 1987 to 2020, so that we could have epidemiological data and climate data that covered the same period. Uh, there was also experience uh, interviews with farmers, local farmers, and how their, their views on climate changes happened. Uh, this was kind of interrupted due to sort of the COVID pandemic. And then with the mapping aspect, there's online open source material that we've used, such as topographic maps and, and you know, country outline shape files. All of these are open source and easily accessible. The main workflow that we developed is essentially you start with the raw data, the climate data, which is online, and the epidemiological data, which is also online. We prepared the data for analysis by calculating seasonal anomalies and seasonal averages across the period. And then we firstly, I tried to identify time related trends. So looking at peak to peak correlations between disease and climate uh, and seeing if there's any particularly anomalous years and spikes in either the, the specific disease or the specific climate variable and whether these sort of overlap at all. This is not the most rigorous of uh, analytical techniques and so it, that sort of led into a more quantitative approach using uh, principal component analyses and clustering tools. And then finally once we sort of identified the variables using these tools, uh, we then developed risk classification and mapping to try and provide that spatial context that I mentioned earlier. So what are our findings from this project? So these are the long-term peak-to-peak um, -peak correlations that I was mentioning at the start of the methodology. It's quite difficult to establish true relationships using this kind of data, just because there's reasons for specific spikes outside of just pure data collection. There's lots of different inputs that could have controlled the amount of data, especially the disease data, um, whether it's particularly years where a census in India collected more data than it typically would, or a variety of factors. So picking out accurate relationships between the climate variables, such as maximum surface temperature, precipitation, vapor pressure, and these bacterial diseases is quite difficult just looking at this. So we went into more of a quantitative analytical approach. Um, firstly, just looking at a regression analysis, using all of the data from 1987 to 2020, it picks out that there's a sort of weak to medium negative relationship between uh, several bacterial diseases, hemorrhagic septicemia, anthrax and black quarter, and these have negative correlations with temperature. Uh, the same diseases also have a weak to zero correlation with rainfall and vapor pressure, which is contradictory to what we see in literature and is, I think is an indication that this data isn't being presented fully through just regression analysis. Uh, so we needed to take it a step further. And essentially, when, once we completed the principal component analysis, we've managed to identify that the monthly average data for maximum surface temperature and average surface temperature in Karnataka have a negative relationship with three out of four of the bacterial diseases that we were looking at, specifically hemorrhagic septicemia, anthrax, and black water. 
For these same diseases, uh, we've noted that there is a positive relationship with precipitation and also with vapour pressure, which is a typical proxy for humidity. We had a fourth bacterial disease, enterotoxemia, that appears to be unrelated to any of the climate variables that we investigated, and so does not appear to be uh, impacted significantly by climate. So overall, what we've managed to identify is areas where there is an increased precipitation and vapour pressure values combined with a decreased temperature is most likely going to cause higher levels of outbreak, just as an association between climate and disease, regardless of other factors that may uh, play a part. So in terms of spatially mapping this sort of uh, relationship, it's quite difficult to truly define the risk without taking any other factors into play. But if we were to look at this from a purely climate point of view, you can see just as this example here is just the monsoon data, uh, there are particular areas which are in the red, which have a higher deviation from the period mean. So these areas are particularly anomalous in that variable. Um, and then there's other areas where it's not so much of an anomaly. And once we've sort of looked at each individual variable, so what, what, what we'll be seeing is higher vapor pressure and higher rainfall, but lower temperatures. Those are the areas that are going to most likely be at the highest risk. But we need to look at that from a throughout the year perspective, not just on a particular season, because when you're looking at long term uh, prediction and how this might impact the agricultural and livestock economy, areas need to be at low risk throughout the entire year, not just in a particular season for effective mitigation to happen. So these are the risk maps that we've managed to uh, build and construct based on the relationships identified. Throughout the different seasons, the severity of risk does fluctuate uh, depending where in the state you're looking. So for example, during the monsoon, the highest risk is in the Northeast, typically along the coastline where it's the most humid and the most wet. Then this sort of varies through the post-monsoon period into the winter, depending on the fluctuation of rainfall and decrease and increases in temperature. The overall total risk uh, is a combination of all the variables in all the seasons in the bottom left in panel D. And we've managed to identify that all year round, based on the 1987 to 2020 data, the northeastern coastline is the highest risk area for these bacterial diseases. And as you move west, going inland, you're sort of relatively decreasing in risk. What's useful about this approach is that we can also note a seasonal and individual climate variable contribution to the overall risk. This allows specific interpretations to be made. For example, if there's a particular domination of the monsoon or the winter that's causing the most risk year round, you can then, uh, you can then integrate appropriate responses to that. So it would be trying to shelter livestock more or address sodden soil um, as the precipitation is going to be the most impacting factor. While if it's temperature, you would be looking more at things like environmentally uh, controlled sheds, depending on what livestock you're looking at. So it's an important thing to consider and to take into account when sort of applying these risk maps to any sort of livestock. So in terms of predicting the future, what we've done is created a few scenarios based on literature um, model predictions for future climate. So it's, it's going to get hotter in India, uh, roughly between one and three degrees, but we've used two degrees for this model. Uh, and essentially it's going to get wetter and more humid as well. So progressively through these scenarios, it's get, we're adding the temperature and we're adding the rainfall, we're adding the vapor pressure, but the relative risk doesn't seem to be changing which is good because that implies long-term a bit more of a stability, but this might vary depending on what other factors can be brought in to integrate with this data and sort of change the level of risk. So where do we want this research to go and what could it be used for? Um, these sorts of data and results could be extrapolated and projected onto areas where there may not be existing disease data, but there's still climate data. So we could make larger risk maps uh, all that's actually needed to develop these maps is good climate data and robust epidemiological data. 
and it's incredibly useful for highlighting zones where livestock or human disease could be lower all year round or higher. We think that this would be a great opportunity to connect with people in the IOA, just because anybody with disease epidemiological data sets could get involved in projects like this, working with climate data, um, as well as other data sets that could be helped to sort of specify down the level of risk on our maps. So other data things like poverty index, land use, soil types, all the things that would typically go into a risk assessment. Uh, we could combine with climate variables to make these more robust. But first and foremost, you need precise high resolution and good epidemiological data, uh, which was something that we did struggle with a little bit in this project, but with further projects and with stronger data, I, I reckon that stronger relationships can be defined, critical thresholds could be defined, and, we, and um, stronger interpretations can be made. Thank you all for listening. Uh, just some relevant publications that, that we're currently working on and any contact details for me and Jenny, if anyone wants to talk about further data sets. But, uh, thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thanks, Adam. That was really interesting. Um, we only have one minute left of the session, so perhaps time for one question or one burning question, if anybody has one, is feeling brave. Nilika. You mentioned um, um, in the, I think the last slide that you want to integrate some of the poverty indices. Um, if I read it right, um, I, I just I'm, I was just wondering: Have you thought of specific poverty index or indices that you are going to use? Because with OFI, the Oxford um, uh, Poverty. Um, the, I can't remember the acronym, the initiative we also did, multidimensional WHO uh, did a publication on um, uh, using multidimensional poverty index or vulnerability indices in emergencies to identify most deprived populations. So I just want to know whether, whether you have thought of going forward using particular poverty index or indices for this action. Thanks. Shall I jump in there, Adam? Yeah, <laughs> go for it. Yeah, um, I, yes, we have. This is basically, um, it's the work, the reason I jumped in is, is this largely comes from another project that I worked on in the UK that Adam didn't, um, which is the one that I presented on actually one of the previous IOA ones where we looked um, at Slough, which is a town in the UK that had particularly low vaccine uptake. And what we found there that there were various variables in there that were tied to, for instance, multi-generational households, the, the lower income families were the more likely that you were, which made it harder for the older people to shift, the older generation to shield if the younger ones were still going out as key workers. Um, we also found, again, that if you were in lower socioeconomic groups were more likely to be employed, for instance, in the gig economy, which again, they were more likely to be perhaps delivery drivers or taxi drivers that were again, were, were moving during the pandemic. Um, and similarly as well, they were more likely to be in insecure jobs where they, if they tested and were positive, they would have to take two days off work and they didn't have sick pay and therefore they were reluctant to, to test. So there, there are kind of various indicators that we know are tied to socio socioecological factors um, rather than climate and environment factors that we could layer on to that, that more, you know, as the maps get more and more and more complicated and the model gets more and more and more complicated and integrated, there are various things. So, so we do, but it, it's certainly useful to know if other people have got some of those breakdowns of poverty that we could potentially tie into. I'll share um, the WHO and OFI publication. So what we were doing, so they use multidimensional poverty, you know, kind of not looking at household income or consumerism or employment, but looking into more health, like vaccination, just like uh, you mentioned, and especially looking into fragile, vulnerable and conflict settings, what, what um, uh, uh, variables we can use, and also changing uh, variables or constructing new indicators when we have different um, emergencies, like whether overcrowding, whether it's um, for, for COVID-19 or access to clean water. Um, so, so you can, of course, change the comorbidities, etc. So I'll share the link um, uh, in the chat box. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. 
Uh, that's great. Thank you, Niluka. Thanks for stepping in there, Jenny. We'll have to um, stop the meeting now because um, we've run over but and people are starting to leave. But we're going to continue uh, to talk about prediction and risk mapping in the next session on the 13th of May. Um, and we'll be sending an email about that in the next couple of days. So thank you for joining today for three really interesting presentations and take care. Bye. Thank you.